Look up to the sky, everybody. If it is a full moon, you know there's a new chapter of three books. So here we are at the end of August. It's the second full moon of the month, the only month of 2023 that has two giant glowing full moons in the sky. And that means we're going to drop a new chapter of three books, right? Exact, exactly on the exact full minute of that new moon. We've also been experimenting with a new format. Hope you guys are enjoying it called Pages. Pages, of course, are little snips of chapters, maximum of 333 seconds long. And I'm dropping them all at 3.33 a.m. Just to sort of give you little morsels of wisdom tidbits of past guests. So if you want uh, the short version of three books, the pages of, of the chapters of the whole book, then you can enjoy those new kind of experiments. Let me know what you think. Give me a call at one eight three three. Read a lot anytime. Also want to give a big shout out to everybody leaving reviews of the show online. Thank you so much. I read every single one of them, including this one from Stitching in Heels on Apple Podcasts US, who writes, I love all the chapters. Only one problem. At age 69, will I live long enough to read all the great books? I'm getting a late start, but I'm on it. Just finished the Johan Hari chapter, and wow, his intelligence is off the scale. The two Daniels were also so thought-provoking. I now have to watch their movie with my 42-year-old daughter, who has ADHD. I can't wait. Thanks, Neil. Keep up the good work. Smiley face with heart um, heart eyes. What's the heart eye emoji called? Heart eye emoji from Stitching in Heels. If I read your if I read your review on the air, by the way, you get a free book. Just drop me a line with your address so I can mail you a copy. And now we got to get into the new chapter. Chapter 127, I can't believe we're at 127 already, and it is with Miss Lenore Skenazy. I'm excited to introduce you to Lenore if you don't know her. So basically, a little background, early episodes of Sesame Street from the late 1960s show five-year-olds walking streets alone, talking to strangers, playing on vacant lots, right? But when those episodes were released on DVD years later, a warning was added at the beginning saying the following is intended for adult viewing only and may not be suitable for young viewers. What is that all about? Well, I read about that anecdote in Stolen Focus by the aforementioned Johan Hari, who was our guest in chapter 121. Johan went on to write in his book and discuss how the confinement of our children is a huge contributing factor to our plummeting ability to focus and pay attention. And he brings this idea to light in the book Stolen Focus by spotlighting the activism of a woman named Lenore Skenazy. So I start researching Lenore, go deep on Lenore, and I find out she was a New York Sun columnist for 14 years, a Jackson Heights, New York City mom of two, and she wrote an article in the 2008 column of the New York Sun titled, Why I Let My Nine-Year-Old Ride the Subway Alone. You might remember that column because it provoked a huge media firestorm. I think she was on like every single, she was on CBC, CNBC, NBC, Fox News, the state, like all within the few days, CNN of, of, of the thing coming out. And she was dubbed America's worst mom. But undeterred, Lenore went on to coin the phrase free range kids. And she wrote a best selling book by the same name, which I read and I highly recommend free range kids. So, then what she did? Well, five years ago, she co-founded a nonprofit called Let Grow, which aims to give kids back the developmentally de- developmentally crucial vitamin our culture has removed from childhood, which is, of course, independence. We're tethered to our kids now. We're tracking their movements, tracking their behaviors when they get in the real world. No wonder they have higher than ever rates of anxiety, depression, inability to cope, right? So Lenore is fighting against us with this with this with this movement called Let Grow. What does Let Grow do? Well, they have created the Let Grow Project, which partners with schools to give students the simple homework assignment of going home and doing something new on your own. She created Take Our Children to the Park and Leave Them Their Day as a day for children to learn how to play by themselves without constant supervision. And Let Grow, which, by the way, she co-founded along with Dr. Peter Gray and Daniel Shushman and Jonathan Haidt, who was our guest in Chapter 103. So we're getting a little... um. Uh, incestuous here with our guests here, but you know what? It's all in service of this, of promoting this, this idea of living an intentional life. Well, they also help draft and sponsor state legislation supporting reasonable childhood independence, which means they have helped actually six states pass legislation, red states and blue states from Utah to Virginia pass legislation, which prevents people from being able to like, you know, call in and report kids walking alone, which as you know, has kind of turned into this emerging issue. 
So, Let Grow is the movement. Lenore Skenazy is our guest. Are you ready, everybody? Let's tap into chapter 127 of three books now. Let's go. I just hit record and you said you thought I was going to be like 60 or 70 years old. (laughs) Yes, I did. (laughs) In part because when I was saying books to you, you didn't go like, wow, those books were written so long ago. I don't think I've heard of them. (laughs) You didn't. Oh, Gilgamesh. That sounds really popular. (laughs) Well, partly it's just, I guess, you know, one thing that books do is they are, they are, they are a compression force, you know, they, yeah. they, they annex all times to our own. I think that I stole that from Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, but it is a privilege My to see you. Right. Yes. Right. 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 Ralph, I said, which book should I choose? He said, choose mine. I said, no, transcendentalism, forget it. Right. I oh, hate well, puns. No, I love, I, I love your latter... I, for what it's worth, I really want to say I love your lateral thinking. I've listened to you, you in a lot of interviews. I, I know lateral. you have a really strong A to F to C to L type of mind, and I really it's, it, it's simpatico with me. No, no, it's it's I'm loving it, and I'm curious: is Jackson Heights, Queens, New York, where you lived in 2008? No, 2008. I was living in Manhattan yeah. in a high rise on the 18th floor of. Um, a, you know, just a development that was actually quite far from any subway. It was annoying, um, but it was Manhattan. Right, you were in Manhattan. So because on April 1st, 2008, I have to give our listeners this context. You use your regular New York Sun column to write perhaps the most viral article in the newspaper's history titled, Why I Let My Nine-Year-Old Ride the Subway Alone. And the piece began with these incredible few sentences. I left my nine-year-old at Bloomingdale's, the original one, a couple weeks ago. Last seen, he was in first floor handbags as I sashayed out the door. Bye-bye, have fun. And he did. He came home on the subway and bus by himself. Was I worried? Yes, a tinge, but it didn't strike me as that daring either. Isn't New York as safe as now as it was in 1963? It's not like we're living in downtown Baghdad. One more paragraph. Anyway, for weeks my boy had been begging for me to please leave him somewhere, anywhere, and let him try to figure out how to get home on his own. So on that sunny Sunday, I gave him a subway map, a metro card, a $20 bill, and several quarters just in case he had to make a call. Long story short, my son got home ecstatic with independence. So 15 years post hence, could you give us a 30 second summary of what happened when the article came out and then give us the, the epilogue. Did your son, <laughs> did your son like turn out okay? Did, did, he, <laughs> right. did he turn, did he turn into some sort of rascally deviant or is he a, a, a you know, a, 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 a peon of independence? You know, what, what happened since? So this, you know, this article was just everywhere. I remember it. Wow. Okay, I'm 43, and I remember this article 15 wow. years ago. I was that's 28. Cool. Yeah. Wow, that's like them now. Um, so the article appeared on a Tuesday, and by Thursday, I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and NPR, uh, defending <laughs> myself, <laughs> right? So I got the nickname America's Worst Mom. Um, but it, it obviously struck a chord, right? Because... The thing that I think most people care about is, first of all, children's safety. But when they think about, what, like, why was this article such a big deal? And I think it's because people could still remember when children had independence. Maybe they weren't on yeah. subways. Most people aren't in New York City. But they remember hopping on their bikes and staying out. I've heard this phrase for 15 years, till the street lights came on. And right. this, this article sort of made you go pause and look at, like, Wow, come to think of it, I drive my kid to school every day or I stand by them at the bus stop and after school they're in, you know, supervised activities and on Saturdays we go to karate and then judo and then karate again. So it, I think it just made people start thinking about the, the giant chasm between their own childhood and the childhood of the children that they were raising or seeing at the moment. And... It is, it is a giant cultural shift. It's as if we all started speaking French in America or, or um, you know, the, the fact that now we eat more salsa than ketchup. I mean, you know, things change, but you need a little fact sometimes, a little, a little pause point to look at it. And then I think the other reason it was so viral 
And by the way, it's not the most viral story that ever ran in the New York Sun because the New York Sun also ran the article in the 1890s or something like that. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. Oh. <laughs> that was the New York Ooh. Sun, you know, as sure as Ooh. there are little green whatever acres, there is a Santa that's Claus. Still, that still comes up, by the way, if you Google is Santa Claus real as the number one hit, and I checked <gasps> last year. Wow. All yeah. right. And I come yeah. up if you yeah. Google America's Worst Mom. So, um, <laughs> So the other thing is that because it took place in New York, and uh, most people don't live in New York, <laughs> most people live outside of New York, and they see New York in every movie. New York is sort of shorthand for both um, America and uh, possibility, potential, glamour, and danger, <laughs> right? And the streets I live of Gotham. In, yes, exactly, right, the dark night, hulking around. Um, I live in a much more... Um, a safe city than that, than the ones you see where there's everybody is throwing garbage cans and bringing Uzis into the subway and the rats are taking over and something's exploding. You know, most of us are just shopping for grapes and going home and going, wow, I already had grapes. You know, it's yeah. not that exciting. Maybe shopping at a Uruguayan bakery if you can. That's right. We go there for our tiramisu and our croissants, which you wouldn't think are necessarily Uruguayan, but there you have it. So, so it, it, it caught fire because it was in this city that um, if you're not living in New York, the idea of letting your child wander out there is like home alone. I mean, it's just some strange idea that you wouldn't do because that's the worst place that you could possibly let a kid go outside. And, right. um, and that, that actually worked in my favor because, first of all, I am here so I could talk about the actual crime statistics and of the 25 largest cities in America, we're the safest. Oh. And also the fact that... Uh, the crime started going up in the 70s and 80s, and then it, it peaked around 93 or 94, and it's been coming down like this ever since. And it just went up a little during COVID, and you're certainly hearing about it a lot, but it's still not up to where it was in the 90s. So people, I think their impression of New York was uh, is, is up here, and the reality, thank God, is down here. Doesn't mean it's perfectly safe. Nothing is perfectly safe. Kids fall downstairs. <laughs> Kids fall out of bed. So, so the idea that that anybody could actually keep risk in perspective and say, it's true, <laughs> right? There is some risk to letting my kid ride the subway, but there's some risk to letting them be driven to school. You could get T-boned by a drunk driver. So, but to be able to say that there's no way I can engineer out all risk, and I, I, I can't make that my life's work because it's impossible, and, and there's something a little... Um, disturbing about the idea that if we only pay more attention and hover our, over our children more hours of every day, either in person or electronically or through a coach or a teacher or whatever, um, then we can eliminate all risk and therefore that's our duty. Our duty is to, to live in the real world um, and, and try to prepare our kids for it. So the article comes out April 1st, 2008. It's on April Fool's Day, interestingly. I know, the, I know. It sounds we're, we're like We're going to say it's it the second most viral article in the newspaper's history since, or at least of the century, okay? That's it. And yeah, let's, let's do that. Uh, 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 so far. I'll just, you're, you're dubbed America's Worst Mom by like multiple major news outlets, N NPR, The Today Show, Fox News, etc. And you, you, you don't just like take this running. You're a columnist. You've been, you've been writing a column for 14, 14 years. You Never. actually take this and you see something and you galvanize it into a movement where today you're running the incredible nonprofit Let Grow, which you co-founded with Peter Gray, you co-founded <laughs> with Jonathan Haidt, you're, you're getting laws changed. So just before we jump into your three books, I just want people listening to give a little litmus test of what is Lenore up to today? And you know, <laughs> stemmed from this article 15 years ago, and what are you doing today? And that way, when I go into your three books, I can keep hinging it back to the work you're oh, doing. Oh, that's great. But I want to give people some content context for that work before we go in. Okay, um, let's see, I'll try to whip us through it. So after all the hoopla on television and the media uh, and America's Worst Mom, I started a blog and I called it Free Range Kids. And the slogan I had then is our kids are uh, safer and smarter than our culture gives them credit for. And mm -hmm. the reason I started the blog was so that I could both, you know, talk about that, but also say like, look, I, I love safety. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, part helicopter on my mom's side. I like helmets and seat belts and mouth guards and extra layers. I'm wearing an extra layer here and I'm boiling. Why was I wearing my extra layer? It's so hot. Um, <laughs> and, and so I just wanted to say you can be somebody who um, cherishes the well-being mm -hmm. of your children and safety and you're not foolhardy. 
Um, and I was an mm-hmm. older mom. I didn't have my kids until my late 30s. So I really, you know, I, I sort of check all the boxes for b- being worried, <laughs> right? <laughs> Even and my your, ethnicity. And your, back, and, your, and, your, and your ethnicity, if I understand correctly from Wikipedia, which is always questionable, is you're a third generation Turkish Jew. Is that right? <laughs> I'm Jewish on both sides. So there's Turks, there's uh, Russia and Poland. Um, Turkish, anybody who's Russian, Jewish Poland, out there will know I'm half Sephardic and half Ashkenazi. The point is I'm a Jewish mom. We have a reputation to uphold. We are hey, the warriors, it, the extra sweater. It, it, Indian we're, moms, yeah, we're, we're I, yeah. I, I'm, I was not raised by a Jewish mom, but I was raised by an Indian mom and Indian parents. So I'm, I'm there's, there's definitely an overlap on the Venn diagram with my upbringing. You know what I, I, I think, uh, here's a tangent. Um, I have a feeling that Jewish moms got the reputation that we have, you know, like always hovering and worrying and fetching and, uh, you know, calling, are you okay? Because the comics were Jewish. <laughs> so they were talking about their moms. But if we had more Albanian mom comics or more Japanese comics, I have a feeling that we would be all, what a Japanese mom. Oh, my God, that's so Albanian. You know, I'm like that, but the Albanians are the most. So what, I'm what not sure the that comics Jewish, were Jewish. The comic strips? No, jo- jo- Jews were like, you know, like uh, Seinfeld and uh, Larry oh, David and, you know, oh, stand up uh, comics. Say the name Sorry, Woody gotcha. Allen and, uh, you know, yes. Carl Reiner yeah. and Mel Brooks. S- S- right? Sarah Silverman. Yeah, yeah. Yes. You, you, you so you Jews have on, a sort yeah. of history of being like mm-hmm. there's the Borscht Belt comics. And um, so we sort of did a lot of stand up, my, my, my people. And mm-hmm. one of the, you know, everybody laughs at jokes about moms because everybody's right. had one. And so yes. if all the comics are Jews and they're all talking about their moms, then it yeah. sounds like Jewish moms are the craziest. Right? It's a it's a great mom in the zeit, it's a good zeitgeist Yeah, that's right. It's yeah. the quintessential, yeah. uh, you know, sort of overbearing, loving, worried mom. And I will right. tell you so, that the, 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 there's a particular joke, which is, uh, uh, did you hear about the Jewish telegram? And it says, if you know what a telegram is, it's when information was sent as quickly as possible. And it would say, um, start worrying. Details to follow. <laughs> it's a great one. It's a great one. That's great. And and by the way, this culture right now, we, we talk about free range childhood. Well, we should also talk about free range conversations. You know. Oh like my God. Culture, yeah, well, that's that's right? why Jonathan uh, Haidt came to me. Yeah, because he was worried that yeah. kids on campus were so worried that they would say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing, accidentally exactly. hurt somebody, or be hurt. Don't worry. He's going to figure into this conversation a few ways. He was our guest on Chapter 103 of Three Books. We had Korean food from his wife in his kitchen down oh, yeah. down on uh, down near NYU campus where he's a professor. And he's the author of The Righteous Mind, The Coddling of the American Mind, and his incredible work he's doing right now on social media through his um, substack uh, called After Babel is Astounding. And he's also the co-founder. You took the blog, Free Range Parenting, and then yeah, she co-founds. Oh, let grow. Thank you for teeing this up. Yeah, so Free Range Kids, I go around the country for about 10 years talking about how we got so afraid for our kids and, you know, this doesn't seem great for them, doesn't seem great for women. I feel like it's sort of a, you know, sort of a backdoor way of making sure that we're just spending way more time on, um, you know, driving kids to soccer and helping them Ah. with their homework and reading aloud and all this stuff. You know, none of it bad, but all of it time consuming. I mean, there was a study that showed that women in the 70s, when only, Mm -hmm. you know, a a much smaller portion of them had started working back then, spent less time on childcare than women. And I think the uh, I think the end date was in the 2010s or something like that. When we've added in much more professional obligations. Right. When they're all working. And what's interesting Mm -hmm. is that uh, Mm -hmm. the amount of time and this is even before now. I mean, it, it is, you know, it either ended around 2000 or 2010, and here we are in 2023. So um, the the number of hours per week more that college-educated women were spending was about eight and a half hours, uh, which is a full workday. And the... You know, you let me do my lateral thinking, I'll tell you. So I was reading a book. Yes, I like books. Um, called All the Single Ladies by uh, a woman named Rebecca Traster. Yeah. So it says, um, it's a history of how a lot of these social movements in the United States were spearheaded by single ladies because back before birth control, they were the ones who didn't have eight kids to take care of and could therefore devote themselves to a cause. And in the book, she talks, uh, Rebecca Traster talks about right after the Industrial Revolution, when suddenly, you know, you weren't um, churning your own butter or, you know, or washing your clothes like this, 
Um, yeah. But anyways, the point is when things got just a smidgen easier in the homemaking department, out come these books that start telling you how to be a perfect homemaker. And they say things like, there's more to setting the table properly than you might assume. And suddenly you have to iron the, the napkins or you have to you know, polish three different sets of forks. And so uh, into the void of free time for women comes new junk you have to do around the house to be a proper housewife. And it didn't seem coincidental to her that um, there was just you know, no, no free time for women is considered good, right? They might, they might get ideas. They might want to vote, for God's sake. And so suddenly here you have the 1970s, and then along comes the women's liberation and equality and, and opportunities for women that were rarely rare, really rare before or even not allowed. And, um, and then that, you know, whoosh, <laughs> you know, in the course of a quick decade or two, um, you're not allowed to just send your kid to the bus stop. You have to go wait there with them and you have to drive them to soccer and you can't drop them off. You have to watch the whole, um, the whole practice. Yeah. yeah. No, you're painting a wonderful portrait about how, you know, through the industrial revolution, when we cr- seem to have created more time, we actually created more demands. And by the way, that's also when radio and radio advertising also entered the home, as I understand it. And we've got this overprotective sort of doctrine that's become pervasive. And so your article in 2008 sort of hit that right on the needle point and it went viral partly because it was so you know, controversial. And then you have nicely turned this into not only a blog, but this Let Grow movement. And so this Let Grow nonprofit, what does Let Grow do? So Let Grow was founded after Jonathan Haidt, <laughs> he of the coddling of the American mind, uh, was speaking with a guy named Dan Shuckman, who yep. used to head FIRE, which fights for free speech on campus. And they were oh, talking great. about how kids um, at college seemed to be a little more fragile than they used to be. Um, easily hurt, um, the mental health services were oversubscribed, and I, I think it's great to ask for help when you need help, and God knows I'm, we've discussed the fact that I'm Jewish, so that means, of course, I've been in therapy. Uh, here, I live in New York. You, you, can't, you, know, you can't hold up your New York Jew card without going to therapy. So, so I'm not against that, but the kids were going for things that used to be a little less fraught, uh, an argument with a roommate, um, a mouse in the dorm, a bad grade, things that, uh, you know, an insult, right? A a tough class. So they were saying that um, it's not like kids suddenly become hypersensitive or fragile when they walk on campus at age 18. Something must be happening or maybe not happening uh, when they're younger. And why do the late stage intervention of trying to explain to kids how important free speech is for democracy, how um, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, how not everything uh, that feels bad to you was meant in a bad way, that's, that's all happening sort of on the intellectual level on campus, and I think it's all great. But they said, imagine if we could sort of tweak the system and engineer young people to be arriving on campus ready for um, robust debate and having their ideas uh, challenged and maybe even going to hear somebody on campus who they disagree with be a speaker instead of shouting them down. You know, maybe they, they should raise their hands and ask a wonderful question as opposed to saying, uh, this, is, this is dangerous or this is, this is causing me harm. The whole idea of trigger warnings presupposed that first of all, you know exactly what triggers people. And secondly, that avoidance is a kind thing um, to, to give to students when actually psychologically avoidance only makes things worse um, think about if you're afraid of something and you don't want to do it and you're scared and you don't want to go and then finally your mom says, okay, you don't have to go to that birthday party. There are kids who are afraid of birthday parties. Um, that flood of relief you get at not going reinforces the idea psychologically, this is how anxiety works, that you were in great danger and now you're safe. So rather than being you know, sort of pushed to go or just go for half an hour, if you don't like it, you can come back and usually can, then kids are having fun. Rather than pushing experience and overcoming um, the idea of always kowtowing to fears and worries and um, I'd say slight paranoia, uh, that is not kind, even though it feels kind in the moment, because it ends up making the kid 
more anxious about something. And so trigger warnings turn out to be sort of the exact opposite of what you would do if you wanted somebody to feel more confident and more ready for the world and less traumatized. So they said, what is happening in earlier childhood, you know, let's say birth through 18, that is making kids believe that when they're uncomfortable, they're literally unsafe. That's the word they use. There's harm and safety. And it's like, well, they came to me because they said, you know, we want to work with you because you're the person that we see on this horizon who's trying to fight the culture of safetyism that is undermining kids by always being with them and helping them and watching them and thereby not giving them the opportunities they would normally have through regular life and regular play and some time on their own to deal with some frustration, deal with a jerk, you know, come up with something to do, solve their own problems. I mean, the, the basic idea behind let grow is that kids need some free time and free play. And without these, when all their time is organized and all their play is adult run, they are not getting the opportunities that those of us who are a little older had yeah. to, to make things happen and to deal with some consequences and even deal with some things going wrong. And I'll tell you, the this is so strange, but basically, I, as I said, I'm part helicopter. And so if you're with your kids, there is no way that you, a normal person, not a helicopter person, just a normal person, won't jump in. If you see them doing something dangerous, if you see them getting in a fight, if you see somebody being unfair, if they look hungry, if they look tired, if you're a, a normal caring parent, you say, oh, let's go now, or honey, that was his turn, or let me help you down, or make good choices, <laughs> always make good choices. And so I don't blame parents for doing that, what I blame is a culture that has made it impossible not to always be with our kids because the minute we're with our kids, we're going to intervene. So Let Grow decided that our goal would be to make it easy, normal, and legal to give kids back the independence they need so that they do end up dealing with some things without an adult there who's going to optimize, who's going to help, who's going to be nice, who's going to provide the wipes and the snack, right? And um, right now in America, giving kids both those things, free unsupervised time and free unsupervised play, has been made um, to a certain extent taboo. And so mm -hmm. our goal is mm -hmm. to make it not just, not just legal, passing laws to try to make sure that neglect is when you put your kid in danger, not when you take your eyes off your kids. But also, uh, it's a very difficult task. What we're trying to do is show that something that's invisible and free is as valuable as the things that cost money and that you can see and you could get a trophy or a grade or even a college acceptance letter. How do you mm -hmm. show that time just playing jump rope with a friend or like I used to do looking for four leaf clovers or throwing a ball yeah. around or waiting for your turn on the swing with your friends is as valuable as somebody teaching your kid lacrosse or hockey or chess. It's it's very hard to believe that when kids are not doing something that an adult is teaching them, that they're still learning, and that when there's an adult, not an adult supervising them, that they're still safe enough to, yeah. you know, to survive. <laughs> oh, that is so interesting. That is, thank you for, thank you for taking a, a minute to open that up because, you know, if you have given us a one, we've had a great conversation about books and in the closing notes after I do the intro and I'm going to add a closing notes, I will add some asterisks because you've had some there wonderful picks, right? My <laughs> side of the mountain, which you co you co-picked with Ali Ward, right? Uh -huh. you, you've had uh, from the mix up files of Mrs. Ba Basily Frankenweil, which you co-picked with Nora McInerney, two of our, two of our all time guests here. So, so we're going to go way back to 1889 to kick off your very first book, which is called simply the blue fairy book edited by Andrew Lang and first published by Longmans in 1889. Oh. It's a solid blue cover with an ornate yellow kind of old mirrory style design inside. There's an illustration of what looks like, you know, a, a, a pen and ink drawing of like Hansel and Gretel. Andrew Lang was a Scottish poet, best known as a collector of folk tales. He lived from 1844 to 1912. The book includes 37 stories, including famed stories like Sleeping Beauty, Rumpelstiltskin, Beauty and the Beast, Hansel and Gretel. You can file this one, Dewey Decimal Heads, under 398.21 for social sciences slash folklore slash fairy tales. 
Lenore, tell us about your relationship with the Blue Fairy Book by Andrew Lang. All right, remembering that I don't remember anything about my childhood, I will tell you that I do recall. It was just a great book. It was filled with, as you say, these classic stories, and they're a lot darker um, than we may think of them today, certainly darker yeah. than the Disney versions. Like Hansel and Gretel, um, they were dropping breadcrumbs. They were smart because they knew something bad was happening. It was the dad had remarried. Of course, there's the evil stepwife, and they had not enough food at home. And so... The, uh, the evil stepmother said, let's all go to the forest, all four of us, um, with her plan to ditch them, which oh, no. she did. Yeah, right? She just left them because that way there'd be food for two people, her and her husband, rather than these awful stepchildren. Now, how they had enough bread for the breadcrumbs, that's a good question. If you're starving, would you really leave breadcrumbs? Maybe they were really small. Um, I just loved fairy tales, and I loved the fact that they're so old. Right? I love anything old. I'm living in an old apartment. Yeah, a lot of people read your viral article in 2008, Lenore, and they were like picturing, you know, the, the, the axe murderer kind of robbing your kid on the subway and so on. You kind of mock that sort of idea that, you know, somebody's just going to quickly abduct my kid, you know, who's normally at the playground or normally on the subway. But you also just mentioned that, hey, the stories were darker. Hansel and Gretel were, you know, about to be offed by their by their stepmother. And in fact, you know, those who have studied fairy tales and folklore, there's something to do with the shock nature, the virality right, right, of right. them that makes them kind of be shared over. You know, I went back and looked up the oldest fairy tales of all time. I mean, they go back thousands of years, well before they were written down. I'm talking Arabian Nights. I'm talking, you know, b- before kind of 2,000 years ago. And so I'm interested in this idea of getting attention. I am. I am because I think of your getting piece attention. And, yeah, yeah. I think your piece in oh, 2008. Oh, how interesting! I see. Yeah, it's like I'm a not, fairy I'm, tale. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'm talking. Your son was given money by a mother without a cell phone. So these days already, 15 years later, the concept of no cell phone is foreign. But but you you know he had no cell phone. He was given some quarters, as you say. He was put on a subway in a big dense metropolis. He was he right. was told to go home. This is sounding a lot like a fairy tale. A fairy tale. <laughs> it should be a basket of food for grandma, is what you're saying. Go into well, the forest. Yeah. Grandma needs a basket. Right. Well, and, and I also know that you've got a couple Ivy League degrees here. I'm not talking any shrink and violet. You've got a Yale degree. You've got a Columbia degree. You're partnering with the, you are partnering with the leading thinkers in the world on these topics, and you're running a nonprofit that is actually changing laws. You didn't say it yet, but like I think it's five states so far because uh, of six legislation. Six as of last you, week. We just got Illinois. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you're tipping over legislation to allow parents to like, you know, sort of not get hassled and arrested by the cops if they let their kids play free in the playground. So so there's something that you've also done. And also, I'm thinking 14 years at the at the sort of right in the hot spots newspapers. I think you wrote for Mad Magazine at one point. I did, yes. Right, right. They know how to yes. bold words. They know how to get attention. I grew up on Mad Magazine. That's why the Book of Awesome, my first book, has randomly bold phrases. It's because Mad Magazine did that. And so what, it, how do we in this, in this cacophonious, is that, the, is, this is the loudest world we've ever lived in and it's just getting louder yet somehow you have been able to repeatedly penetrate the noise. You have been, you have been with your articles, that, you have been right, yeah. with your movements, you have been, mm-hmm. and you told me in an email, I'm cha- we're working on changing society. Well, a lot of people are working on that. Not many people are getting laws changed and partnering <laughs> with the lar- fo- most foremost th- thought leaders in the world. So what is, how do we get attention these days? And you are a storyteller too. I know you're a storyteller. You craft these wonderful stories. Like for those listening, you know, talk to me about getting attention in the world today. How does it work? What are the sort of challenges these days of, of sort of truth and, and, you know, movements like this getting, you know, drowned out by by the sea of noise and how do you think about that as you keep moving forward with this kind of um i want to say activist type of work that you're doing i'm just gonna replay this part of this interview every morning when i get up and i go oh my god another day what can i say children need independence they are being deprived it's not good for them um So first of all, the reason this story um, originally got a lot of attention is for the reasons that we talked about before. It was in New York City. It's surprising. I might have sounded cavalier. Um, I I looked back at old columns of mine. You sashayed out the door. I sashayed. I write. I didn't creep out the door Uh nervously, chewing Uh my cuticles, right? So part of it is that um, it was a bold piece, but 
also I looked at, so I found like three other articles by me about the same basic topic from earlier years. Like, yeah, I let my kids, you know, two boys, right? I let my kids go to the boys bathroom at the, you know, on a, at a Broadway show. I'm not worried about them being raped and abducted. Or yeah, I let my kids go down to the courtyard. They're six and eight. Uh, I'm not worried because it's a courtyard and it's surrounded by a building. There's no cars. Uh, you know, I've written, it was a consistent theme. It's like, yeah, come and arrest me. All I'm doing is being rational and giving my kids some freedom. But none of those went viral. So the reason that this particular article went viral was the subway. I'm pretty sure it's the subway. Mm -hmm. The only thing that people have seen, people are scared to go on the subway. Ann Curry, who was the woman interviewing me on the Today Show, said she didn't let her teenage kids go on the subway because there's people shooting up. And Actually, now there are sort of sometimes people shooting up. But back then, there were nobody shooting up. And actually, I have never seen anyone shooting up. I've never seen a crime on the subway except a guy get on the subway with um, a joint during COVID. So it's the, the disconnect between me living in reality, my aphantasia, and everybody else imagining the worst case scenario and embroidering on Will Smith movies they'd seen or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. That was what was big. But... I just want to stop for a second and talk about the power of story because uh, a guy I really like named Frank Faridi, F-U-R-E-D-I, he wrote How Fear Works and he wrote a bunch of other books. Um, but he says that all societies have stories that become sort of ingrained and cultures have stories that they tell themselves over and over too. And for um, you know thousands of years, they were fairy tales, but the culture, we t the, the story that our culture is um, is attuned to and almost, I'd say, addicted to is the story of a, um, a white middle-class child taken by a stranger and um, raped or murdered or somehow never seen again. And um, the way that Frank Faridi talked about that in his book is he said, imagine if you see, you know, an anchor man at the desk and uh, he's about to read something and there's a picture behind him and it's of a park, it's of a playground right? Just an empty playground. What is the story that he's about to read you going to be? A what kid do, gets taken think? from a playground. Right. So, um, so my story was about a kid um, being left alone and being fine, right? And actually being happy, despite all the people who told me this was crazy. But what was interesting is when I was on uh, the television shows and podcasts and whatever, for years and years afterwards, we would the, the, you know, the interviewer would ask me, like, like you did, you know, what happened? What, you know, I left him in the store. He came home. And, and then they would pause and they'd say, but, but how would it have felt if he never came home? Mm. And, um, but it took me a long time to realize one thing that I talk about a lot, which is that my real crime was not worrying that he would be safe. And so this was right. a way of chastising me because something bad could have happened. You never say that to somebody who drives their kid to the dentist. What if you had been hit by a car? What if you had a yeah. stroke and, you just, know, just went off the car edge accidents of a being much more, much more common and dangerous. Right. Right, 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 right. So first of all, it was just, you know, but you weren't thinking, you weren't thinking dire enough. And if you thought more like the rest of our culture, that things terrible happen the minute you take your eyes off your kids, um, then you wouldn't have done it. So it was a way of showing that I was heedless and sort of immoral, like I didn't really care if my son lived or died. Um, but really, what I realized after reading the Frank Faridi book is that this was a way to take a, a story that was really just happy, right? A triumph of a child, you know, taking their first steps in a way, first steps towards independence and turning it back into the story that we wanted to hear, which is what if he hadn't come home? So yeah. he had come home, but now we're talking about what if he hadn't? Yeah. And frankly, I've been on a lot of TV shows where they've put me on with somebody whose, whose child was tragically abducted. They, uh, I can't remember what station it was, CNN or CNBC put me on with the with the father of Polly Class uh, two or three times. And Polly who, Class, that? It's, a, it's a tragic story. It was a girl who was taken from her home and murdered. But um, as my sister pointed out, she was taken from her home. So why are you talking like, how dare you let your child be out in public? You know, something terrible could happen. And then it didn't even matter that there was no parallel between my story and this tragedy. And, and your heart goes out to them. But it was a way of putting on a cautionary tale, even though the cautionary tale really had nothing to do with a child out in public. So 
uh, when you talk about stories that have resonance, my story had resonance because it was surprising and it was set in a place that people feel familiar with, even if they aren't. But the real story that has resonance today is a child unsupervised who ends up, um, you know, kidnapped by a stranger. And what you've done nicely here in terms of talking about the power of story all the way from Hansel and Gretel, from the Blue Fairy book, all the way up to your viral article in 2008, Why I Let My Nine-Year-Old Ride the Subway Alone, up to today, is, you know, you've shown, and it's happening to all of us, that there is a growing kind of late stage capitalism encroachingness that gets all of our amygdalas in a pincher. And when it does that, we become very puppeted by the forces that, of course, know how to garner game and monetize our our fear based, naturally fear based, biologically fear based attention. You know, my friend Tim Urban, who was a former guest on the show and wrote the recent book, What's Our Problem? You know, he calls politics on TV, you know, essentially another version of like the bachelorette. You know, he talks about how what we do is we politicalize and caricaturize real life to the point where it can only be played into these kind of fear-based morsels. And I guess I hear and see and understand that, of course, in this podcast, we're aiming for something different. It's long form. It's cerebral. It's no ads. I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to create a tiny little dot of, you know, in, in the oil here. <laughs> and I'm also curious as someone leading a, a nonprofit right now who is seeking attention you're trying to get i saw your email signature it's like you know bill maher's talking about you you know you're 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 linking to the press as you as you necessarily would and should do to get change in the form of legislation but how do you think about ethically and morally as a storyteller getting attention today well um since i don't think i'm using fear and i think that's actually been to my detriment um you know, there, there are studies, and I, I don't talk about them enough, that say that, you know, kids' mental health is deteriorating, um, you know, and, and in fact dire, thanks to a lack of independence and free time and free play. I actually leave that to other people to talk about. Um, I don't mind saying that kids are depressed and anxious, but I, um, I don't like going to darker places than that. And I also, um, I'm always pulling back from being quite that doomsaying because yeah. I, I don't want to blame parents. I mean, I think parents are already so betwixt and between told Definitely that anything their, their kids does, <laughs> yeah. my, anything the kids do yeah. bad is because you weren't attentive yeah. enough or you didn't read to them yeah. or you, you know, you were absent from their lives for some reason. So um, I feel like the thing that is driving parents crazy is this idea that your kid is just this... Um, lump of clay that you have to turn into something and also there are a million dollars that you better be watching because anybody will steal them at any point so um ethically i haven't I, I don't think i've stepped over the line that much <laughs> i'm trying to do it sometimes <laughs> no 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 and i and and i'm not uh, saying you have it's if i was how saying we, your yeah. kids are doomed you know if you let them have a cell phone, they're doomed. If you let them play outside, they're going to be kidnapped. If you don't give them enough independence, they're going to kill themselves. I can't say that stuff because it's not true. And it mm -hmm. also just makes parents crazed with fear. I mean, what am I supposed to yeah. do? I'm supposed to watch over them because they might be kidnapped, but if I watch over them too closely, they might kill themselves. That's like, what am I supposed to do? And so all I try to do is say like, you can't do everything. Kids are who they are. The culture is, uh, the, the, the country is less unsafe then you think kids are more resilient than you think. And if you liked your free time and your free play, you think you got something out of it, you know, then you don't have to have your kids in something every single second because they're gonna get a lot out of their free time and they're goofing around and their mistakes, as well as all the things that you've organized for them. Right, that, right, right. It's, it's, right. Not, as, it's, it's, it's yeah. not as potent as telling them, if you don't do this, your kids are ruined. And I'm kind of wondering as I listen here, I'm a parent of little kids. Um, oh. I've got four, I've got four I've got four boys and I, as of right now nine seven four so and lucky. two, and so I feel very lucky and and I wonder if that little pencil line that you're drawing from free play to lower mental illness or stronger mental health I wonder if that 
I wonder if we as in this conversation today and as a yeah. sci- need to need to draw that in marker and pen a little bit more. You have some interesting studies on that, don't you? Like, why is it yeah. that my kid running into walls and knocking over blocks <laughs> and spilling jam all over the place? Why, why is that helping them not get anxiety when they go to college? Like, why is that? I think it provides you. I think Mother Nature put the play drive in kids so that they would work on all the difficult interpersonal and um, emotional uh, things. <laughs> that's, the, that's the word Mother Nature used, things. Um, that kids need to be resilient and resourceful and optimistic. And uh, I won't talk about Peter here. I'll talk about this other play worker I once met. And her name was Penny Wilson, and she lives in London. And she told me that fun is the orgasm of play. And I was mm. like, wow, that's that's the weirdest sentence I've heard in a while. Um, unpack that, please. <laughs> and and what she said is that kids are driven, as the rest of us are, um, for yeah. this great thing. And for mm-hmm. kids, it's fun, right? But fun doesn't just automatically happen. Fun can be just, you know, bouncing a ball or whatever, but often it's with other kids. And so that means that you have to find a kid who's willing to play with you. You have to be a good enough playmate so that they don't say, God, is this boring? Or you're always the queen or whatever and walk away. You have to come up with something to do. You have to, if there's there's, there's a bunch of kids, you have to decide the teams and you have to make the teams basically sort of fair. Everybody says, forget it. I'm not playing. Right. Uh So in and then you have to negotiate. Well, like if I touch the tree, is that in or out? It's like, well, that's in. But if somebody else touches the the tree, you have to leave. Right. All those um, activities the the sort of the courting of somebody else and the compromise and the decision making and the problem solving well what about harry harry's only three who gets him on his i don't want him on my team i don't want him on my team how about he's on both teams or how about he's the the ball boy and so you figured out something to do with harry and um all these readings of other people and negotiations and decision making and rule deciding and democracy Okay, that rule sounds fair. We'll all agree to that. We're going to play by that. All of those things are in the, you know, are what you have to go through to get to fun, right? To finally play the game and to play the game in a way that's, you know, fair enough that it's that it is fun. Yeah. And not have not just be burdened by Harry or figure out something. Oh, to do with I Harry. see. So fun is the orgasm of play, meaning that's what you eventually get to if you do everything else first. Right, and you're so motivated to get to the fun that that that's why mother nature put the play drive in kids so that they would learn all those social emotional skills and toleration for frustration and compromise and communication um you know explaining the game no 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 i didn't mean the tree was free i meant we're free if we hit the tree or whatever it's all um it's not like kids are always having fun when they're playing but they are getting there. They're very motivated. They're way more motivated than you'll see them in almost any other situation, like bath time or reading or school. And so when adults are with them, they see the kids wasting their time. You know, you guys are arguing so much, I'll make the teams. You guys, yes. that ball was out. I'll just say it, that ball, you get, you, get, you get to go first, but then you get to go twice because you're going second. And so the, right. the parents, are optimizing, they think they're optimizing the time. We're getting straight to the fun, and why should you waste your time? But they don't realize that that wasted time is is Mother Nature's plan, right? Or evolution's plan, or right? And so that's why you need to have some time, yeah, without the adults there, because the adults get frustrated too, and they don't want to see you wasting your whole, you know, we only have an hour at the park, and you guys have been arguing for 15 minutes, you know, everybody to the swings. There's so much that just explodes out of me on this. I, I'm, th- I'm thinking of many things. One is chapter 46. We had Dr. Laura Markham on this show, and she gave us a book called Dibs in Search of Self. <gasps> I uh, can't by- believe it. I was thinking of that. Oh, my God. Why did she give that to you? That's so uh, beca- old. That's from the 70s. 
Wow. Yeah, well, well it's not as old as uh, 1895. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Neither am I, she hastened to add. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, but I remember reading that book and how much of it was play therapy, right? Like it's about, you know, the, the, the child is, is given things to play with. I like the noise in the background. We're getting the true Jackson it is New York. experience here. Wait, I have to say, and, the reason I, I was going to choose Dibs in Search of yeah. Self is because it was one of the first grown-up books that I read. My sister or my mom had it, and then I realized, like, oh, my God, I can understand this book. That's cool. And it opened up that world to me. Like, I'm oh, not that just, book was I don't have to read just kids' books. Yeah. Uh, so we are going to add the very first asterisk ever on number 866, Dibs in Search of Self by Virginia M. Axline. And it's going to go to you. We add asterisks when we have guests repeat a pick, which is great. And um, so let's keep moving. Mother Nature put the plan. Mother Nature put the play driving kids so they would work on all their interpersonal stuff and get it worked out. You said that Penny quoted you. Fun is the orgasm of play. And now let's move mm-hmm. forward in your life a little bit. I want to get to the book of knowledge. Uh-huh. The Children's Encyclopedia. It just came out in 1911 by the Grolier Society. It's a big, <laughs> yes, dark, my blue son, cloth that hardcover. Was my first book. <laughs> yeah, writ- edited by Holland Thompson, who lived from 1873 to 1940, an American historian who wrote about the New South and served as editor of the Book of Knowledge. Um, basically, it's, a, it's one of the first encyclopedias aimed at children. Uh, it was a reprint of the British Children's Encyclopedia that was brought to the United States. A 24-volume set, if you can believe mm-hmm. it. File this one to 031 for information slash dictionaries and encyclopedias. So tell us about your relationship, Lenore, with, with the Book of Knowledge, the Children's Encyclopedia. Um, so as we've discussed, I grew up in Wilmette, Illinois. Every year there was a giant tent erected in uh, the parking lot of the big mall near us and it was a book sale it was for brand to benefit brandeis university and i must have gotten the set there and what a mom i had sure we'll take these musty dusty uh, 24 volumes of an encyclopedia that was written basically when she was born and uh cart them home and let you have them in your room why anybody wants a really superannuated uh encyclopedia i don't know but my mom always said march to your own drummer and she let me do that which i'm really grateful for so i had these these volumes and I would open them and what was cool is that they were old when I was young so that was already intriguing I already liked old things but also it brought you to a different childhood it was a childhood when for fun kids would flip through this and there would be a chemistry lesson or there'd Uh be um, uh, how to make an origami something or other or Mm -hmm. how shall we make an electric cart (laughs) or something and there'd be uh, diagrams of you know go to the chemist and ask for you know saltpeter and a small bomb you know (laughs) and then bring them home and you know ask your mother for you know some flour and a uh, I don't know the iron and it was always expecting you to be very resourceful very curious very hands-on and busy with stuff that you were doing just for fun. There'd be French lessons in there. There'd be um, Bible stories and there'd be fairy tales and there'd be little documentaries like how does the squirrel survive the winter? And what do people in you know Timbuktu eat on a daily basis? And so it was so wide ranging and it so respected the idea that naturally you were curious and capable and you had a long Um, attention span and I didn't think of those things when I was reading it it just assumed those in me and frankly I didn't make any of the stuff it was hard I didn't know how to make a you know I couldn't go to the chemist for saltpeter and then make something out of it but um, I just relished that world of doing and thinking and being and a, just a ton of free time. I mean, this was not saying, remember, after you've done your homework and Kumon and you've studied your vocabulary word of the day and, um, you know, it's not, had your parents sign off on your reading log, then for the six minutes that are left, why not, you know, splash in the bathtub? It wasn't that. It assumed that you had free time and that you would browse through this world of endless possibilities and do some of them. 
So do you think the so do you think the pendulum's going to swing back here? Because you know we we we're so far the other way. Where you know if I were to sign my seven year old who's never been in any sports at all ever, up for soccer, say he he would already begin behind everybody else because the other kids that he's playing with. I experienced this <laughs> with my other son a year ago. Yeah. They'd been in soccer for three or four years and they'd been practicing corner kicks and they knew how to head the ball. And, and this is just like local cheapest, except most like it's house league. It's not like rep or anything. And mm -hmm. I could tell my, my son felt like he was behind, right? Because we started him, I guess, at a relatively later age, although it wasn't that late. So what, where does the pendulum go from here? You, you we have one message that sort of completely contradicts our other message, and we try to get them both out, and I hate talking about them both in the same place, but I'm about to. One is you should let your kids play outside, go to the bus stop by themselves, have a lot of free time, unsupervised, go to the park, run errands, etc. Once in a while, I would get letters from parents who were doing something that they and I considered very reasonable, letting their nine-year-old walk home literally from the library. That was a Virginia story. Or um, letting their kids uh, walk home from the park or play outside. And they had been, uh, somebody had called 911 because they'd seen unsupervised children outside, which I always say is like seeing an escaped lemur from the zoo. What are these things doing here? These don't belong outside. They should be caged. And so, um, in, you know, I would I would publicize these stories because I was so enraged that anybody would second guess a loving parent who thinks their kids are ready for some independence. Um, and yet these were actually happening. And so uh, I, I teamed up uh, this wonderful woman named Diane Redleaf, who has been fighting uh, on behalf. Uh, she wrote a great book, too, called They Took the, Child they Took the Kids Last Night. Um, she's been fighting Child Protective Services on behalf of decent families for 40 years. Anyways, the, 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 the problem with Child Protective Services is that um, we've become so concerned that any time a child is unsupervised that they are automatically unsafe that we have told even passers-by, you know, err on the side of caution, be a good Samaritan, call. Um, people particularly call if they ever see a child waiting in a car. Um, because they think that um, car waits automatically equal death. And in fact, waiting in a car for a few minutes while a parent runs an errand is actually safer, statistically safer, <laughs> than taking a child out and, and walking them across a parking lot. So, um, so because we don't know the reality, which is that you know we're living in pretty safe times, not perfectly safe times, and we assume that a child unsupervised is a child whose parent has been neglectful because why aren't they with them? Otherwise, you know, the child isn't safe. If the parent was good, they would be with them. Parents get investigated for neglect, even when they've made a very rational, literally rational, safe and, um, and loving decision to let them do some things on their own. So um, I used to give a talk where I would say at the end, you know, like we have to make freedom or childhood independence easy, normal, and legal. And one time somebody listened to me and actually took that idea. Uh, a guy named Connor Boyack took the idea back to Utah where he ran a libertarian think tank called Libertas. And he found a sponsor for what he called the Free Range Kids Bill. And the bill said that, uh, you know, ordinary activities of childhood walking to school, playing outside, waiting, you know, being home alone for a little bit, or even waiting in a car during a, you know, an errand. Um, these things are not neglect unless a parent puts the kid in actual serious, obvious danger, letting your three-year-old cross the highway at midnight. So um, it passed in Utah unanimously. Um, and became law, and there was a big um, flurry of notice uh, back in 2018 when that happened. You know, Utah becomes the first. Go Utah. Yeah, go Utah is right. But in any event, after Utah passed its law, then Oklahoma did, and Texas did, and then it looked like, are we only red states? Um, but then Colorado passed the law, and now it's called the Reasonable Childhood Independence Bill rather than the Free Range Kid Bill. And, and it just passed this, uh, like about a month ago, it passed in Virginia, unanimously and you might know that Virginia has had some contention when it came to you know what kids should be able to do and what parents should be able to decide for their children and it's been you know it's been pretty fractious except that unanimously they passed the reasonable childhood independence bill and then it just passed in Illinois uh, and so 
the, the intersection here is that they recognize that our society has sort of started thinking that kids can't do anything safely or successfully on their own, but parents know their kids better than anyone. And if the parents think the kid is ready for it, if you decide to let your four kids play on the lawn and one of them is really young, but you got the other three out there and you think they're pretty responsible, that's up to you, not up to somebody passing by calling 911 and not up to the state or the province or, or certainly some you know, social worker or cop who presumes to know your children better than you do. So when the law passes, what changes? What can't, what doesn't happen anymore? What can't happen anymore after the law after So the law if passes? somebody calls um, Child Protective Services and says, mm -hmm. uh, this happened, okay, this happened in Maryland. Um, uh, there's a famous case of the Métis family in Maryland that let their kids, 10 and six, walk home from the park and they were investigated for, ch for, for neglect. And that became a sort of celebrated case. And then, darned if a couple months later, they didn't let their kids walk home together, golly, from another park, um, even closer to their house. And on that one, they got a hold of the 911 call. And it was really interesting because the 911 caller said, hi, um, I'm calling because there's two children outside who are, um, they, they were just coming up and, and I'm walking my dog. And they said, what did they do? And they said, well, they wanted to pet my dog. And then what happened? Well, then they petted my dog. And it's like, well, why are you calling? It's like, well, aren't I supposed to? I mean, do they look unhealthy? No, they look fine. Do they look like, you know, they've been burn marks? No, 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 they're fine. But they were, they're out here and I thought I'm supposed to call. At which point, if our law had been passed in Maryland, um, the 911 operator could say, well, if they don't look like they're in distress, and especially if you talk to them and they know where they're going or whatever, then thank you, you know, thank you for your care and concern, but that's not a problem. And then they wouldn't have to refer it to Child Protective Services, and even if it got referred to Child Protective Services, they would not have to come and do an investigation. Um, so it really, it sort of stops in its tracks both um, this, this very wasteful system that feels compelled to um, investigate any time somebody is called to their attention. And then it spares the family. I mean, families that I've talked to that have been investigated, you know, Child Protective Services is a, 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 you know, a government agency that has the power to you know, chastise you or to tell you to never do that again, which is what they did with the Métis. They had to sign a, a promise that said, I'll never let my kids out of my sight again until they're like, you know, 95. And then, um, and they also have the power to take away your children. So in South Carolina, when we had um, a guy testifying for our law where it didn't pass, it's not like it just sails through all the time. Um, he was a foster care and then a foster dad who had, I think then adopted two children, one of whom was 10 and his older son was 12. And his 10-year-old was playing, was doing her homework on the front lawn, and somebody called 911 to say there's an abandoned child, there's nobody home, this kid can't even get into her house. Why they thought this, except we were talking earlier, you and I, about how there's fantasies in people's minds, you know, and it goes directly to the worst, darkest place first. Well, it turned out the dad had been inside, and this was her, his kid just wanting to do her homework outside, which actually sounds kind of pleasant. Um, but Child Protective Services then had to come investigate, even though they found out that it's a 10-year-old and the dad was inside, but there's six months of, a, of um, being investigated and, and uh, watched over. And the dad had to tell his son, who was like, what's happening? All these people keep coming to our house. He had to, to tell his son what was going on. And he said it broke his heart because when he had adopted his son, when he first fostered his son, he said, I cried every time I looked at his feet. And, and me and the rest of the legislature goes, what are you talking about? And he said, because his, his biological mother had poured boiling water on his feet and they were, you know, so deformed and it, it's just too horrible to think about. So here you have a dad who has taken in uh, a young man, made him his son, loves him to death and his daughter and is so grateful for his family and they're so grateful for him. And simply because a child was unsupervised on his front lawn, he's being investigated and his son has to worry he's going to be taken away. So we can't have that. We just can't have that. That's just absolutely anathema to what family means and to what the government should be doing. And so our laws allow that to stop where it starts. Thank you for your concern. I'm glad you care about the kid. You know, we knocked on the door. It turned out the dad was home. The kid's his. She was doing her homework. The end. That's, that's what happens when you get our law passed. It stops right. those investigations. 
So there's something, I think of it as a virus that's going sort of worldwide in the countries that can afford it to, to undermine our idea of what kids are capable of and how much they are in danger and burdened unless an adult is helping them all the time. And, you know, 15 years waking up, talking to these, you know, geniuses around the world and being put in, on television and in books, it's because I really am shocked that a lie can take hold. And the lie is that children are in constant danger and that they are um, weak and needy and only do well when there's an adult constantly ministering to them. And anybody who doesn't think that doesn't care. Children are in constant danger. The lie that has taken hold is a really nice segue into your third and final book, Free to Learn, by the aforementioned, multiple time aforementioned, Peter Gray. This book is published in 2013 by Basic Books. We are we've 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 jumped up over a hundred years now for your last <laughs> book. It's got free to learn in like a nice bright green nature colored, uh, uh, kind of like a chlorophyll type of green font. And there's there's two children playing above a stream on a log, kind of a piece of wood. One's got a stick in their hand. They're peering down below. Peter Gray, born in 1946, is an American psychology researcher and scholar, uh, over of, of professor of psychology at Boston College, known for his work on the interaction between education and play and for his evolutionary perspective on psychology theory. In 2016, Gray helped found the Alliance for Self-Directed Education, an organization which promotes self-directed education for children and teenagers as a replacement for traditional schooling. And he was president of that till I guess, a few years ago. What's this book about? He argues that our children, if free to pursue their own interests through play, will not only learn all they need to know, but will do so with energy and passion. Children come into this world burning to learn, yet we have squelched such instincts in a school model originally developed to indoctrinate, not promote, intellectual growth. Dewey Decimal Heads, you can follow under 155.4 for psychology slash childhood. Lenore, tell us about your relationship with Free to Learn by Peter Gray. Uh, it's the book I find myself recommending more than my own. Um, so Free to Learn came out after my book, and that's probably good because if it had come out before my book, I'd say, like, just read his book. <laughs> it's all you need. Um, and I met Peter, I guess, shortly after he'd written it. Or maybe before he wrote it. Anyways, he's now one of the co-founders with me and John Haidt of Let Grow. And I read the book on vacation, and I usually like fiction um, better than nonfiction, and especially on a vacation. But I just, I just, you know, it's the proverbial could not put it down because I felt like each page, and I was, I was actually rereading it this morning in the park because I just love it so much, and it teaches me so much, and it really points out that, like, you know, what do kids learn? just when they're born. I mean, they learn whatever language. I mean, they could learn Chinese if they're in China. They could learn Chinese and English if they have, uh, you know, two parents who are speaking different languages to them. They learn how to walk. They learn how to play. They learn how to joke. They learn how to argue. Um, and they do it without instruction. And they do it because they're compelled to do it. And the compulsion that continues on throughout childhood is this desire to play that we were talking about before. So that's that's Peter's contention is that, uh, you know, Wordsworth actually said it first. Uh, he said, the child is father to the man. And when you think about it, that's true. We're kids first. I mean, that's like the oldest part of us is a kid. And I'm not saying find your adult inner child. I'm saying that there were hints of who you are and what turned you on um, before there were things that you had to do. And when you are turned on by an idea or to try to figure something out or to try to do something better and better, I mean, I, I can't do it anymore, but I used to draw all the time, uh, but I also used to write poems and stories and stuff. And um, when you're doing it for fun, you get the focus that, you know, teachers are always wishing their students had and you get the perseverance because it's hard to get kids to do the boring stuff for just for school or because they have to. But when you're motivated, through that motivation, you can learn the stuff that you need for the boring, the, 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 the perseverance and um, the, the willingness to go through some pain and frustration. There was an interesting study done about how kids now 
can can't hold on like a chin up as long as they could a generation ago and can't do oh, interesting. some other I could never hold a chin up. So. It's funny. It's funny. Now that you mentioned, I remember as a child being like seeing kids like, you know, chimpanzee it across the chin up bars. And yeah, it's like we don't I don't see that anywhere <laughs> anymore at all. Yeah. My kid climbs uh, trees in the park. And, and, you know, when my kid climbs trees, everyone's like, oh, get down. That's so scary. You know, it's it's pretty. And then I read an article about how like Finland parents like let their kids break their arms out of the trees because it's better for them in the long run. And they're just aware of that. And, so. They give them a lot more free time and they don't start formal education, I don't think, till seven. But the, the thing about the chin up is um, why kids are um, don't have, you know, can't do it as long. And there was another uh, another similar exerting <laughs> exertion exercise that kids do less for less seconds now. And the thought was not just that their muscles aren't as well developed. It's that their frustration for, you know, pain, discomfort and difficulty is down and mm. tolerance for discomfort tolerance for discomfort which takes us back to college but what i wanted to say about that um tolerance for discomfort was that that's something that you get in play you know i have to you play freeze tag you have to you have to freeze right that's a lot of self-control you know you play hide and go seek and it's scary are they going to find you um, that's dealing with uncertainty and fear. Climbing the tree is dealing with danger. And so in play, kids get a lot of the, um, these other skills that, that will serve them in the corporate world, that will serve them in their marriages, you know, shut up and just wait. And, and what Peter does point out um, in his book is that all animals play. And um, some animals, like, the, like the example he gives is gazelles, right? So gazelles are born and a few hours later, they're starting to do their thing, which is to run after each other and, and you know, just sort of, it looks like frolicking. I'm sure they don't call it frolicking because they don't call it anything, but they're running after each other and they're out in the fields or whatever. And that's dumb in two evolutionary senses. One is that um, they're wasting calories right? Yeah. They're just, they're burning them all up. So they're going to have to replenish them. So that's already, uh, you know, a negative. And then two is th they're running around. So they're more visible and there are predators around. So why would mother nature put that drive into the animals instead of just putting the drive to stay close to the mother and, you know, play on your iPad. And, um, the reason is that what they're getting from play is even more crucial to their survival than not playing. Even though not playing looks like it would be safer, playing is safer in the long run. So to, uh, to ignore play and to replace it with adult organized activities, we were talking earlier about how parents will come in and skip over all the, you know, all the tough parts, the, the negotiations and the frustration just to get to the play. But Mother Nature put play drive into all animals so that they would learn what they needed to do. And when I, when I read Free to Learn, there were just so many examples over and over again of how trying to help kids can actually hurt them, undermine them. And one of the examples he gave is that, um, I'll just give you two examples that he gives from the book because I was just rereading it. One is that there were some kids in a kindergarten class who had, you know, on popsicle sticks, there's sometimes riddles. Yeah. You know, yeah, I remember those. Like, yeah. why did the morons, you know, tiptoe past the medicine cabinet and so not to wait the sleeping pills? Um, <laughs> but so they were trying to 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 were you know to to figure out what it said so that they would have the fun, the play of figuring out the the riddle. And the teacher said, you know, put down those sticks. We're going to learn our letters. And mm. so, you know, it's not that every lesson is pointless, but it's just that you could see kids really engaged in learning because they yeah. cared versus something superimposed. And the other example he gives is of a, um, of an experiment that was done. And there were three different kids of kindergartners. And the first group was shown this toy that did four different things. It squeaked if you pressed it, it, you know, lit up if you tossed it, whatever it did, it did four different things. It made noises. Um, and in the first group, the teacher showed the kids the toy and she pressed the button that made it squeak. In the second group, the teacher showed the kids the toy and pretended to be like, oh, I wonder what this does. And she's like, you know, mm, oh, look. And then she pressed the button and, oh, my, it made a noise. And she's still sort of noodling around on it. And in the third group of kids, the teacher said, here's a toy. <laughs> and that was it. And 
in the two later groups, the kids were very curious, right? And they, they started to explore it themselves. It's like, wait, not only does it push, does it make a noise, but if you shake it, it lights up. And it's like, wait a minute, look, and you open it up and there's a mirror or whatever. But in the first group where the kids had been shown something by a teacher, like this is what this toy does, that was the end. They just sat there and then, oh, and they pressed the button and it made the noise, yeah. squeak, squeak. So we can't... No joy of learning and discovery. Right, so um, the the model we have of a lot of education, and whether it's us teachers, or, you know, parents or teachers or coaches, is do what I'm doing um, and do what I'm telling you to do, and that is education. And it sort of ignores all the all the things that kids would get out of curiosity and discovery and exploration if we gave them, if we trusted them with some more, if we trusted those things to kick in, you know, the education that comes from discovery and self-direction. Yeah. Oh, there's so many quotes from this book that I, I just I pulled out that I wanted to talk to you about. Mm-hmm. Young people today are less likely to have a sense of control over their own lives and more likely to feel like they are the victims of circumstances, which is predictive of anxiety and depression. So what he's talking about there, what Peter Gray talks about a lot, (laughs) is what you call an internal locus of control, the feeling that I can make things happen. If something bad happens, I'll be able to handle it. Uh, it, It's the opposite of feeling like a victim or uh, especially a victim of fate, which is not to say that there aren't some bad fates out there. Um, An external locus of control, as you might guess from the name, is the idea that somebody else is in charge. You, you have that feeling like if you're in a rotten job, I mean, you left your job, right? If you feel like yeah. somebody else is determining, you know, how you do, you know, what you're gonna do and whether it's good enough and comparing you and just micromanaging, that's a bad feeling. And um, the, the time you have obviously the most feeling of control is when you're playing, because you get to leave if you're not having fun or you get to say, that's not fair, it's all, um, you're doing something because you enjoy it, obviously you don't have to keep doing it if you don't enjoy it. So there's a lot of internal locus of control that's built when we give kids free time and um, freedom. You know, Not that they shouldn't be doing chores and have responsibility, those all go along too. And, and the person who's better about all that is, um, is the person Micheline Duclef or whatever who wrote Eat, Hunt, Gather, Parent. It's a really good book talking about how kids really want to help out and have responsibility and we can harness that and kids feel more like they matter and they feel more competent so so i wouldn't say uh, i'm not ever endorsing you know a completely lackadaisical life but just that there is some free time and freedom in it so internal locus of control one of the things that let grow does because we are trying to actually change the culture and not just complain and say we're right and it's wrong, is we have two programs for schools and they're both free. And one is the Let Grow Play Club, which was Peter's idea, which is just to have the schools stay open for mixed age, no electronic devices, free play after school. So you have you have something as close as possible to probably what's going on in your living room right now or your backyard and certainly what was going on in my childhood which is just kids playing and some of them like each other yeah. and they play each other and some of them well, don't this is why my 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 kids love it when there's the uh parent council meeting because m- my wife leslie takes them to their own school and they just feel like they have just free reign in the gym and they can open the storage cabinets and just run around and take any ball and all the other kids that you know who's whose parents are on the council. And it's like their favorite night is this council night where they just get to be in the school, but just doing whatever, you know, I didn't know you had the program, but like, it's just so, so on point with what they love. It is so, it is so on point that it's, you know, it's a little poignant that they Mm -hmm. live for one day (laughs) a month or whenever the council meets of a chance to just play freely with their friends. It shows you, it's like, you know, you'll get to have, you know, you get to drink water once a month. It's like, oh, that's great, because I'm really thirsty. Oh, this is so great. Like, okay, now we're gonna go home. We're gonna give you powdered water for the rest of the month. So, So clearly this is what kids want. And we've done, you know, we've done observations, we've done some studies, and it shows that like, it really helps with loneliness I mean, yeah. kids are lonely these days, especially post COVID. They, yeah. yeah, and so, and, and there are sometimes kids who, who don't have a friend in their class, 
or their grade because they're super smart and these kids seem like boring them or they're slower and they, you know, they're sort of left behind. But yeah. when you get to play with all the different ages, you yeah. know, you have a chance to find your, your kindred spirit. And that really changes school for those kids. Well, this is why there should be recess in high school and university and college. And yes. stuff. You know, why is recess reserved for the young? You know? And why is recess so short, right? When yes. recess is just 20 yes. minutes, it doesn't give the kids enough time. There's, there's a word for it. But somehow, like, you know, the first 20 minutes, you're figuring out what are you going to do and yeah. how are you going to do it. And then just as you, it's like play us interrupt us, right, to go back to the orgasm of fun. You just, you know, suddenly you're about to have fun and now it's time to go back and sit in your chairs for another couple hours. That's very frustrating. So kids need a wide swath of time with other kids and loose parts, which are everything from balls and chalk to an old typewriter, a suitcase, a tire, whatever it is, just junk to play with. So, so the Let Grow Play Club is a great idea and it has resulted in like less discipline problems at schools and happier kids. So that's one of the things we do. But the other program that Let Grow suggests schools do, and once again, this one is free too, all our materials are free, is called the Let Grow Project. And we were just talking about the internal locus of control. The Let Grow Project is a homework assignment that schools give kids and it says, go home and do something new on your own without your parents. And I just rewrote this huge list. I mean, it's like, you can walk around the block, you can start a carnival, you can climb a tree, you can run an errand, you can make breakfast for the family, you can, you know, uh, go rake leaves for money or to be kind or whatever. There's just a million ideas and the million ideas, um, there's another million ideas beyond the ones that I wrote in this list. Uh, so why is that important? Well. We have a, a, a friend who is a professor of psychology at Long Island University who decided to use the Let Grow Project as therapy for kids with a diagnosis of anxiety. He's hmm. normally a clinical psychologist. He has PhD students. So rather than treating these kids the way he normally would, which was with cognitive behavioral therapy, which I also believe in and think is great, he treated them with the Let Grow Project. So these were very anxious kids, and I'll just tell you about one of them. Um, but all four, he's done just four families so far. But um, one kid, 10 years old, very nervous and parents very nervous. He's the only child. Um, and the, the, he was, had gotten to the point where he was afraid to walk upstairs and downstairs in his own house without a, an adult there. And, and I've heard this several times. I used to think it was like somebody exaggerating, but I've heard it before. So they, they offered him the chance to do something really big and new on his own. And for some reason, that was more attractive than just being scared. And so he decided he would walk home from school by himself. And the first day he did it, his mom was so nervous that she had to take the day off work to wait home to make sure that he was going to be okay. And, and sure enough, she heard from somebody who saw him on the route that he was going the wrong way for a little bit. But then he went the right way and he found his way home. And I actually think that's better. I love the fact that he got a little lost because... That shows him that you can even get lost, and, and it's not the end of the world. Because anxiety, what is anxiety? The idea that something bad is going to happen, I won't be able to handle it, and I'll be hurt forever, right? So here it is, something wrong happened, he was able to handle it, he wasn't hurt forever, he came home. The next day he walked home, and his mom could go to work. And then that weekend, he's a train kid, he wanted to take the train. Yay, another train kid um, by himself. And so he got to take the train four stops in, wow, something's really loud here, but I'm sorry about that. He took the train four stops on the Long Island Railroad, which is probably about 10 miles, not eight miles, whatever. And, and after that, there was no stopping him. Not only, obviously, did he go upstairs and downstairs by himself without even thinking about it anymore, but that was the end of last school year when he was in fifth grade. And now it was the beginning of the school year in September in sixth grade. And it's the first day of school. And you get to come and get your locker, your homeroom, your combination, you know, your first day in this new school and the school said of course if you'd like you can bring your parents and and he told his parents mm, no I got this and he was one of the very few kids in the school who didn't bring his parents so the point being that it went from a boy who was very scared and anxious and I'd say when you're anxious it's depressing because everything seems scary and too hard for you to a kid who was bold and who had this internal locus of control that, yes, I can handle it. And um, since then, this professor has tested the, the, the Let Grow project 
the independence activities, he calls it, on three other families, and it has been just as spectacularly successful. And he says it's working faster than cognitive behavioral therapy, which was his specialty. And so, uh, you know, you, you know, when I do get grandiose, I think, wow, well, maybe this is a new therapy. Maybe we've, we've taken so much autonomy out of kids' lives that simply giving it back, which is free and fast and fun, is going to make this country's kids less, and your country's kids, less, less anxious and depressed, and not only more ready for college and the workplace, but just more open and happy and successful as human beings. And so that's what gets me up in the morning, 15 years after why I let my son ride the subway alone, because I really feel like once people realize how quick and easy it is to make kids whole again, they will. Amen. Um, your work is resonant, Lenore. I've, this is coming at me from all angles. It's not just Jonathan Haidt. It's not just, uh, it's not just Johan Hari. People are talking about it. I've been following you on Twitter. I've been retweeting all, all your incredible, you know, you are, you have a knack for finding these great stories, like that great video you posted a few days ago about like why kids don't walk to school anymore. You've got your finger on the pulse of a movement that is burgeoning and it is growing and you've opened it up so carefully um, with us today through formative books, but also through all the work that you've been doing for now, you know, it's veering on decades now to sort of <laughs> move the culture forward um, in a really positive and healthy and still safety oriented way. I think that's it. You, you've mentioned that a few times, but like it's not unsafe. It's safety oriented. It's just oriented towards massive amounts of free play being super good for our mental health. And we have a huge mental health crisis. So it's perfect timing for this work. To close off this banger of an interview, I've got some fast money around super quick book questions. Okay. Hard, hardcover, paperback, digital, or audio? Oh, what do I like best? Yeah. Um, I really like reading books on my phone because I can read them at night without turning on a light. And also okay. I can take them on the subway. Okay. How do you organize your books on your bookshelf? Oh, my God. If I showed you, uh, I don't. <laughs> They're just piled. Okay, okay, that's okay. What is your favorite bookstore, living or dead? I go to the library or I go to Kindle. So um, I, I don't go to many bookstores. I'm Which li- favorite library? Oh, my favorite library is the Jackson Heights Library, just uh, two blocks from where I live. Our number one most common question is how do you personally make time to read? Oh, I try not to do any work on Saturdays. And so that's a good time to read. And I read before bed. And when I get a great novel, I can't stop. I just, my favorite novel recently was Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. I read that in a weekend and I'm a slow reader. It's just so great. From our guest in chapter 103, we've mentioned him many times, Jonathan Hyde. I told him I was speaking to you and I said, do you have a question for Lenore? And Jonathan sent me an email. He said, did Lenore ever consider being a stand-up comedian? And if not, (laughs) why not? And if not now, when? Uh, I never considered it, and um, I, my, my stealth thing is that I give lectures that are funny, um, but nobody expects them to be funny, so there's no pressure. People think I'm going to be this spinach person who is going to tell them, you know, our children are in trouble, and here's why. So, no. Thank you so much for coming out to your books. I really appreciate it. You're going to be helping a lot of people, including me, and a lot of parents think about how that they, we are raising our children. I really appreciate the work you're doing for the world. Thank you, Neil. Hey everybody, it's just me, just Neil again, hanging out on my basement couch, the brown couch with the backpack full of wires, sitting back and listening to the wise Lenore Skenazy with all of you. So many quotes jump out. I got a few written down here. Our duty is to live in the real world and try to prepare our kids for it. Very simple. Second, kids need free time and free play. When all their play is organized and adult run, they are not getting the experience of things going wrong. Amen. How about this one? What I blame is a culture that has made it impossible not to always be with our kids. When we're with our kids, we're going to intervene. Let Grow is designed to make it easy, safe, and legal for kids to deal with things without an adult there. I'll throw in one extra quote just for fun. Mother Nature put the play drive in kids. Let your kids play outside and have unsupervised time. 
so difficult to do some of this stuff in practice. Everyone signed up for a million things, karate class, baseball class, and if your kids are alone in the park, there's no one there to play with half the time. It's not like you can just ring doorbells and meet kids. Everybody signed up for a million things. So how do you actually do this in practice? It's about taking baby steps, getting back into the idea that you can put your kids out to the backyard, feeling less guilt when you're not with them all the time. And I really do highly recommend uh, Free Range Kids, Lenore's book, which, you know, at the end of every chapter in that book, it has little sort of ideas. You know, if you have a nine-year-old kid, drop them off at the ice cream place, let them stay there for 20 minutes, go pick them up. Things that feel hard in practice. Let your six-year-old ride their bike around the block, but which help us kind of relearn the idea of being more hands-off. I'm very grateful to Miss Lenore Skenazy for giving us three more books to add to our top 1,000, including number 629, The Blue Fairy Book by Andrew Lang. Number 628, The Book of Knowledge, The Children's Encyclopedia. It doesn't have a specific author on it. And number 627, Free to Learn by Dr. Peter Gray, who was mentioned a few times because he's the co-founder of Let Grow and a prominent psychologist and professor in this field. We also have a few asterisks to add, including to my side of the mountain, uh, which is originally picked in chapter 113 by Ali Ward, from the mixed up files of Miss Basil E. Frankenfiler, which is picked in chapter 91 by Norm McInerney, and as we discovered in the conversation, Dibs in Search of Self. Well, I'm going to put an asterisk on that because, you know, Lenora said she was just about to pick it. I don't think Dibs is going to get another asterisk in the in the in the next fifteen years. We'll see. Uh, so that one was originally called out to us back in chapter forty six by Dr. Laura Markham, and I highly recommend you check out all those chapters if you haven't. Ali Ward, Nora McInerney, Dr. Laura Markham. Thank you to Lenora Skenazy for coming on Three Books, and thank you, thank you, thank you to all of you for listening. Are you still here? Did you make it past a three-second pause? If so, I want to welcome you back to the end of the podcast club, one of the three clubs that we have for three books listeners. There is, of course, the Cover to Cover Club. You just got to self-identify. I'm starting to keep a list online. Just drop me a line. Let me know you're in the Cover to Cover Club. People listening to every single chapter of three books are attempting to listen. If a guest doesn't rubs you the wrong way or I rub you the wrong way, as I'm sure happens sometimes, you know, we're going to give you a credit for that. Um, and we'll add your name to our FAQ. Drop me a line. It's too bad I'm keeping that list starting kind of recently because so many people let me know over the years. But I'm going to have to, if you haven't told me recently, let me know that you're on the cover to cover club so we can add you. And then there is, of course, the secret club, which we just had a mailing for. So if you're in the secret club, you will have got something in the mail recently from me. If you aren't and you don't know what I'm talking about, Give me a call at one eight three three read a lot and I'll give you a clue, a clue for how to join the secret club, which is entirely analog only. And then finally, there is this club, the end of the podcast club, where I talk directly to you, you talk directly to me. We hang out, we have an after party, uh, and we we uh, we play your voicemails. That's how we always kick it off. Let's do it now. Let's go to the phones to kick this thing off. Here we go. Neil, hello there. Oliver Harris here, calling from uh, New Zealand. Uh, love the podcast. It was a bit late to it, so I'm playing catch up. I think I'm on about episode 19 or so, uh, but it's fantastic. Please keep up the good work. Wanted just to let you know of a fantastic book I, I'm reading now and I'm close to finishing. It's called Outlive by Dr. Peter Atia, um, who's a longevity uh, expert, very well known doctor because he's best mates with Tim Ferriss and he's on lots of podcasts. And it's a really fantastic book that talks about um, really sort of medicine 3.0, as he calls it, which is sort of preventative medicine um, focused on helping us avoid the, the, the illnesses that are unfortunately killing a lot of people, um, sort of degenerative diseases and, and uh, cancers and so on. It's all about it's focused on how we can prevent those from coming on in the first place rather than sort of the current medical system, which is really just treating uh, you know, symptoms when they appear. Anyway, fantastic book. Highly recommend it. Neil, thanks so much for, for your work with this. I love the show and I will keep listening and hopefully catch up to uh, uh, your current episode uh, in the not too distant future. All the best from Aotearoa. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much, Oliver, for calling all the way down from New Zealand. Love New Zealand. I went back there. I was there in 2006, drove all around the South Island on my honeymoon. Um, for my first marriage way <laughs> sounds like sounds so weird to say that but it was so long ago went all the way down to new zealand had a great great few weeks down there um 
think about it a lot, actually. Just to, And I wish I was a birder then. How many birds did I see and hear down there that I didn't really know what I was doing? Anyway, when you said at the end, by the way, all the best from Aotearoa, I was like, what's Aotearoa? I had never heard of Aotearoa before. So I looked it up, A-O-T-E-A-R-O-A. Aotearoa is the contemporary Maori language name for New Zealand. I did not know that. I did not know that. Origin looks like it's unknown. Work can be broken up as ao, which is cloud, dawn, daytime, or world. T, which is white, clear, or bright. And roa, long. A cloudy, white, long, uh, evocative Maori, which is the indigenous culture of New Zealand, name for New Zealand. Beautiful. Thank you so much also for giving us a tip off to Outlive by Dr. Peter Atia. That book has just been everywhere lately, hasn't it? I'm glad that you're recommending it. I I have a copy. I'm on chapter three right now. First two chapters I found a bit slow, but I, I'm, I'm so eager to learn all the other stuff. I got to keep plowing through and you've gave, given me a push. I really appreciate that. So that book is Outlive by Peter Atia, A-T-T-I-A, which I learned recently that he's also you know from Toronto, went to Queens. I'm from Toronto-ish, went to Queens as well and then he went down went to stanford became a doctor and now he's doing all this wonderful stuff on longevity so um i really appreciate you pointing out that book to us okay now we kind of did the letter of the chapter this time at the beginning but should we do another letter yes let's let's do another letter okay this letter because we did a letter at the beginning which is the review but let's do another one uh now okay so i'm gonna pull one up here right here this one comes from Cape Breton, from Tierney Saunders. Neil, quick hello from Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. Just finish your podcast bookmark with the Holdernesses. Awesome. I'm not a dedicated daily podcast listener, but anytime I manage to fit and listen into my busy working mom, three humans at one pop schedule, yours is my go-to. Your content, your energy, your openness are such light in this hectic, heavy, sometimes heavy life. Truly so much of what you share resonates. Kind of like my personal going to church feeling. Sending a very sincere thank you and hope it's part of what fills your cup today. Tierney Saunders, thank you from Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. By the way, I have I feel I have this deepening affinity with Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. If you get my book club email, so that's the email I send out in the last hour of every single month. I've been doing that since 2016. You can head on over to Neil.blog if you haven't if you don't get that and you want to sign up. I've I've realized that I've reviewed two books from Cape Breton recently. One is the novel Crow, which was great and funny and sardonic. It's a bit it's a bit long, I thought, but also it's just the, the voice is just really strong and penetrating. Great kind of kind of novel about a 30-something-year-old woman who gets newly diagnosed with cancer and goes home to live in Cape Breton. And then also I read Ducks. Ducks is this graphic novel that was featured up in Canada on the TV show Canada Reads. And as a result of that, it was featured in the front of all the bookstores up here. And it is a, a woman's, I think her name's Kate Beaton, her, her account of going to live in the oil sands, which is the kind of area a few hours north of Edmonton and Fort McMurray, where there's just the largest kind of you know gas and oil industry in Canada. <sighs> Uh, but it's it's told in the sense of a graphic novel. So this book, this graphic novel, ducks in this novel, in this novel, crow. I'm like Cape Breton is coming out. I, I'm I'm suddenly Cape Bretoning it. I've never been to Cape Breton, by the way. For those that don't know, it's an island off of Nova Scotia in the Atlantic Ocean in the Maritimes of Canada. I think it's only got a couple hundred thousand people there, but but culturally, it's batting way out of its league. Thanks, Tierney, for the letter. And of course, if I read your letter on the air, a book is yours. I will sign a book and mail one to you. So just drop me a line with your address so I can ship that out. Okay, now let's go over to the word of the chapter. And for the word of this chapter, let's go back to the eloquent Lenore Skenazy. That's just absolutely anathema to what family means. Yes, indeed, it is anathema. Anathema. Did I say that wrong? Anathema. Anathema. Of course, I said that really wrong. Anathema. Anathema. A N A T H E M A, which, according to Merriam Webster, means someone or something intensely disliked or loathed. Okay. A ban or curse solemnly pronounced by an ecclesiastical authority and accompanied by excommunication. The denunciation of something as accursed. A vigorous denunciation. These are all definitions. Anathema. 
Anathema. Anathema. Where did it come from? An accursed thing from Latin. An excommunicated person. The curse of excommunication. Okay, it's a pretty intense word. A thing, a cursed, slight variation of the Greek anathema, which merely meant a thing devoted. Literally a thing set up. By the time it reached late Latin, the meaning of the Greek word had progressed through thing devoted to evil or a thing accursed or damned. Okay, that was pretty, that's a pretty intense word, anathema. I want to challenge you all to use that in a sentence sometime this week. Just give it a go. Just give it a go. Give it a go. Give it a go. Something or something intensely disliked or loathed. Well, I hope that is the opposite of how you feel about three books. You made it all the way to the very, very end. Whether you were on a long drive, you're on a long walk, you're hanging out doing the dishes, it was a pleasure and a privilege to enjoy your company, hanging out in chapter 127 of three books. Until next time, until the next full moon with some pages in between, remember that you are what you eat and you are what you read. Keep turning that page, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.